This is Alexa Linton, and you're listening to the Whole Horse Podcast. We're now in season six. Thanks to all of you tuning in and sharing the podcast with your friends to keep the momentum going. This podcast is dedicated to all things horse and all things that uplift equine well-being and welfare. And I'm having down-to-earth conversations with equine professionals about the little things that move the dial slowly but surely towards a better world for horses. You'll find all the episodes, 93 and counting now, on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcast. Thanks for being here and enjoy the ride. Hi everyone, it's Alexa Linton here and you're here for the Whole Horse Podcast and I'm back and I realized the other day that we are officially in season six, which is crazy to think, um, six, going into the sixth year of the podcast. So uh, really have a lot of gratitude to all of you who are continuing to listen. Thank you for being here and uh, bringing back a a favorite guest today, Heather Nelson, is with me today. Hi, Heather. Hello. And when you say six years, I, I actually think that we've already done like six podcasts. I think I, it's about that. Yeah, yes. I was looking the other day because I wanted to see, well, what was I nattering on about in the last podcast? Like, because you know how I'm always changing things. So I wanted to kind of see like, where was I at then compared What's to now? A, a Heather podcast a season. That would make sense to me. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, <laughs> it does. Like yeah. a necessary thing for us to do together. And, and Heather and I are today on Zoom, but we have in the past been knee to knee because we we do live like 15 minutes apart from each other 15 gigantic minutes Alexis so yeah. we're doing the zoom thing <laughs> we are and I still kind of have COVID so we thought that Heather did not need the particularly terrible strain that I I got uh like 12 days ago but I still feel pretty tuckered out so so she is safely away today but it it was like the perfect kind of completion of for those of you that don't know I had a hysterectomy five weeks ago literally almost today actually it was like tomorrow would be five weeks and then if you've listened to the podcast you know I had like you know some crazy stuff happen so it's been a bit of a year I think Heather I've chopped this year up to just like this is the year of health stuff for Alexa. Um, even for podcast listeners, it's been like a pretty stop start to time <laughs> in the podcast uh, universe here. So appreciating everybody who's like actually tuning in today. And I know Heather, you've had yeah, you know, I mean, what I tell myself of years. health issues because now after me, I've got a couple years into a head injury. What I keep reminding myself after having previous injuries in my life, so mm. previous like what I would call health years, is that they are actually in a way a blip because five years from now we both could look back on this year and barely remember the pain and suffering. <laughs> so, and, and it always launches you onto something else. That's what I always find, mm -hmm. right? Like every time we have to take these health things, then there's like this weird incubation period for creative types like us. And then we kind of move in a direction or move in a new direction. So they're always helpful, even though there's a lot of pain and suffering and misery that go with it. We promised we weren't going to get into the pain and suffering and misery <laughs> on this cat. We were going to stay light. So I'm <gasps> telling everybody now we're not going to stay in this vein today. We'll start about like we talk about the creative blossoming that comes out of it instead yeah, of that. Absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm slowly getting there to the creative blossoming moment of of this of this stuff. And I'm, I am excited. I've got a few things sort of coming up in the next year that um, I can't like totally talk about yet, but um, Ooh, secret stuff. It's, it's fun. Yeah. Like as far as some of the equine cranial stuff I'm doing with Elise and probably by the time this comes out. Um, yeah. I putting together a, a three person clinic with Lockie Phillips and Elise Mickey and myself. So Ooh. That's pretty cool. So there's a few things like that that are coming up. And and I know, you know, for yourself, I, I have curiosity because I know you've really followed this, the R plus track and there's 
been this shift and change in your training and, and how you offer things. And, you know, I know this is an area for, for a lot of people, as far as training that they're like, okay, they're starting to distinguish between negative reinforcement, positive reinforcement. And there's finally some, you know, more nuance coming in, especially in our part of the world. I don't know. It's like, let's say it feels like in like other parts of the world, there's maybe more awareness of these different aspects of training. And I don't know if you found that out here or if it's changing. I, I think it's, I think it's interesting you used the word shift because I'm seeing a pretty big shift and I want to say it's like globally if and, and the shift might just be so that six years ago was when I first picked up a clicker and was yeah. going to be like I'm going to run my little experiment and I'm just going to start using clicker training but I was still primarily a negative reinforcement teacher um, and trainer and then two years ago I, I had thought, okay, well, the clicker is really helping. Like this, this works out great. And I was like to challenge myself. So then I was like, gonna drop my negative reinforcement training mm -hmm. as much as I can. I kind of thought, how hard could it be? Um, but there was actually a giant shift that had to happen. But when I'm talking about it in myself, um, but when I'm talking about the global thing, it wasn't even so many years ago that I couldn't find a lot of resources. Yeah. Like, I couldn't find a lot of people to follow, to learn from books, to read videos, to watch or courses to take. They were out there, but I really had to dig. And I don't know if it's because I'm more in that bubble now, but I see a lot more of it. And I was quite nervous that my students wouldn't come on to the path and into the train of like, hey, let's try positive reinforcement. Let's try to make that our primary way that we school. And actually, I'm finding they're ready for it. Like mm -hmm. they're they're eating that up they really want that because I think for myself the reason that I did it was not because I think negative reinforcement training is terrible it's highly effective it makes perfect sense to horses really but it was more that I looked at it and went okay so the, the re negative reinforcement means we take something away so we take something that the horse isn't liking so the concept of like pressure and release we put some form of pressure on and taking away that thing is what makes the horse learn and so I realized so I'm irritating my horse to get them to want to do the things that I want to do and that was the part that really started to niggle in my head I was like no matter how pleasant I am with my whip and my cabison because I'm a trainer and like I can use academic art of riding I'm still annoying my horse to get them to do the things that I want to do. However mildly, I'm that annoying thing, right? And I didn't want to be that annoying thing anymore. And I think in the past, I didn't really understand, because we, you know, we were always told, like, don't give your horse rewards, like, don't give them cookies, they'll, they'll become a monster and all this, or you're, you're just cheating if you use those, or, you know, you're bribing your horse or all this kind of stuff. I think there's, there wasn't enough knowledge out there about mm -hmm. the fact that rewarding is an entirely different system but it's like it's like this equal and opposite thing that there's negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement and there's nothing wrong with giving a reward adding something a horse enjoys to make it learn well not make it learn but help it to learn and even that the word make like that's part of the mindset shift <laughs> that can't mm -hmm. be like well I'm gonna make my horse do this you know it's more like setting up the situation so my horse wants to do this and that has been a really huge shift and something I'm enjoying and something my students are enjoying too but I'm seeing it all over like people people want to know this they don't want to irritate yeah. their horses yeah for sure and I you know I, I'm sure you felt it as well like you say before six years ago or whatnot like you know even finding resources on this was challenging um I'm sure that that is different in different parts of the world, but, but I would agree. Like, I think kind of this, this thing out there that was like, oh, you could do, <laughs> you know, training like this. You could this. do that you if could all do you that, wanted but... to do was like trick train and fill your horse's <laughs> face with cookies. But like, that's not real training. That was kind yeah, of more That like, was kind yeah. of the feel, right? And, and so <laughs> yeah. it's really cool. I mean, I, I am a how do I say this? I, I've come to the realization that I'm, I am, this is going to sound judgmental to myself, but like, I'm not a particularly, um, structured training person when it comes to my horses. 
And I do appreciate that about some of the work we've done together. It's like remembering to like put treats in my lovely fanny pack and actually like have rewards on hand can be like a challenge for me. Um, and I know we were going to talk about treats because I know that that is a, uh, a potential hang up for people. As it almost can as... be it, it can be a taboo subject. Totally, if you are talking to a certain group of people. Yeah, and certainly, I think even for myself, that was how I was raised. I mean, it was okay to like give your carrot after your horse had already worked for half a day. That was okay, right? But it wasn't acceptable to even like I remember I was thinking about today. I don't know if you remember my horse Peyton. I bought him as a sale horse. He was a buckskin Clydesdale. I bought him out of um. So he came from Manitoba and I had him shipped over to BC to train him and sell him. And he was a lot wilder than what the um, people who are selling him portrayed in the ad. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and the hauler. So he arrived to like the island and then the new hauler who was going to like pick him up from there. The local hauler was like, there's no way I'm putting this horse in my trailer. I will not do it. And so she just dropped the ball and he was still like two hours from home. And he, here's a half wild, well, more than half wild. But this is a wild Clydesdale, okay, yeah. from the middle of Manitoba. It was a PMU baby. And so I went up there to go put him in the trailer. And I remember this mentality being like, if I put food in the trailer, I'm cheating. Like I'm not allowed to do that because like wow. it's the wrong way to train a horse. Yeah. And that I have to train, like this, this crazy idea that I had to train him to get into the trailer. And that if you put rewards in the trailer, that wasn't training. Now I'm already seeing a shift now that that isn't yep. how most people would approach this. Okay. But this was like, I don't know, over 20 years ago. And so back then it was still not even very common to just put hay in the trailer, like in order to get a horse to get in. And yeah, like he, I spent like an hour or two with he was running away and everything. And then I just put some grain in the trailer and he walked in. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because I had this mentality that I was like cheating or like there was something mm -hmm. wrong about mm -hmm. using food. That was some sort of like weird negative thing to do. When like, why would he get in that box? He had already traveled the entire way across the country. This is a big country. He was a wild horse. Um, he needed a reason to get in there and he needed that reason to be more than I was just this annoying mosquito trying to <laughs> bother him outside the trailer and get him in, right? So there's that part of it. And then mm -hmm. there's the part in regular work where we're talking about people being concerned that they're gonna turn their horses into little monsters um, who are just looking for treats. So. I don't know there's still like so many layers of it because I also had all these concerns about oh I'm not going to be able to get any kind of reliable like behavior by using food I also had myths around um I guess I just want to say like there would be no safety if I was using food. Mm, so I guess mm -hmm. that kind of goes with the reliability thing. And also just this belief that I wouldn't be able to do like real work with a horse, like hard stuff. Like I sure you could teach them to do tricks and things, but I didn't think that a horse would want to be actually like, you know, breaking a sweat, working on something really challenging just for food rewards. So there was like a lot of things I didn't understand about positive reinforcement training I'll just say that yeah um and that kept me from getting into it and I think that was a real shame I should have got into this like when I was a teenager <laughs> instead instead of now <laughs> and I think and I think that like people are really missing out even if all they do is just add more mm -hmm. tools and um and aspects of positive reinforcement to what they're already doing because I'm not the kind of person who thinks you have to just be positive reinforcement even though that's the direction I'm like yep. trying to walk um the reason I chose to walk that was actually because I needed to like handcuff myself so that I wouldn't be doing I wouldn't fall into old habits mm -hmm. if you set your whip down or whatever it is lead rope halter bridle whatever it is that you're using for your negative reinforcement you gotta come up with another system because <laughs> you yeah. can't you can't make anything happen whereas if I'm still holding my whip I can kind of fall back into my old habits um and so sometimes when I'm using like my canvas in the line I can sometimes fall back into my old habits so I just try to do almost everything at liberty um just because it's teaching me like I'm the one who wants to learn and so 
that's one of the things I do. Mm. But there is like a whole system to it. And that's how you can make it safe to feed treats. And there's a whole, you know, we can really get into that. I'll just shut up now and you can ask any questions you want. <laughs> I am in, I am intrigued about that. I mean, honestly, I think it's such a, um, it's a, it's a barrier for a lot of people to try, even try clicker training. Um, maybe they're just not into the fashion statement of the fanny pack. I don't know, but no, they're just so <laughs> sexy. I find there's just nothing like more bulk around your waistline to totally. really improve a photo shoot. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm so grateful for my fanny pack. Um, <laughs> like you were there when I got that. Yeah, I I think it, it's um, the sense, you know, that a horse is going to get distracted or grabby or um, like, like you say, out of, you know, off focus um, if there's any sort of like food rewards present. And that's why we have to be so careful about how food rewards are introduced. I mean, most mm -hmm. people, when they first think food rewards, they're picturing, you know, fancy treats from the shop or carrots or apples. Those are totally. not the food rewards that I'm using with my horses or with my clients' horses because that's just too fancy for them. Like they get too jazzed up about it. They do. I literally have chopped straw in my treat pack. Like I have hay pellets, chopped straw, and then I will combine that. And this is really fine chop straw like it's so fine um that it's glittery and everything it's like horse glitter so mm -hmm. like when you like bring it out it's just like glitters all over the ground it's very fancy but um <laughs> but it's not that tasty so it's not mm -hmm. that motivating right but the hay pellets the chop straw and then I'll have some sort of low sugar kind of treat that's mixed in there because what helps is if you are kind of surprising your horse with what they get so sometimes they're going to get a handful of just like hay pellets. And and there are some horses I'm going to just use hay, like actual mm -hmm. handfuls of hay, because they need that, like something to chew on that's big like that. And they need something that's just not very exciting. So if it's their usual hay, then they're not going to get all that like jazzed up, over aroused and be like digging around for it. But another thing we have to remember with the digging around is that it's our horse's instinct to search for food so we have to kind of rather than judging it and immediately going to oh my god this is the worst thing ever and then like whacking their heads away from our, our our treat pack we need to think about okay that's their instinct now i need to give them a replacement behavior that they can do instead um so like maybe it's something like a target or it's teaching yeah. them to stand still and keep their head over there nice and straight just so that they know what they do need to do in order to get the food I find that that's a big piece of it because people just kind of expect their horses not to want the food, not to want to touch them. But instead, you need to give them that replacement behavior that shows them what can they do to get food. And in the beginning, you need to be pretty generous. And I find that's one of the things that's most interesting because somebody who's initially making the shift to using more food rewards is going to be the stingiest person out there in horse training <laughs> because they're really thinking like, one treat for like I don't know it's either like a time limit you know they should only get like one treat for 10 minutes or it should be like one treat for this whole string of fancy behaviors um and that can make a horse really frustrated because they're just like oh there's, there's food here but I'm not really getting the food and so uh, a lot of the times when you've got a new horse to positive reinforcement and a new person to positive reinforcement you just have to give yourself permission to be extremely generous with the low value, boring food. So your horse doesn't have a chance to make a mistake. Mm. Yeah. Like if you're teaching a standing still behavior, most people would kind of like, okay, I'll give, well, actually I'll tell him to stand still and then he better stand still for like five minutes. And then afterwards I'll give him like one little cookie, but the horse doesn't know they're supposed to stand still. Like they have no idea what's required here. And so it may be that you have to like kind of let go of the purse strings a little bit and you have to like feed while you're standing, feed while you're standing, feed while you're standing. And then you start to slow it down. Feed while you're standing, feed while you're standing, right? Feed while you're standing, right? And the horse starts to learn, hey, as I'm standing here, I'm getting rewarded until you build up that duration to maybe, okay, now we can stand there for five, 10 minutes, right? Without a food reward. But it's pretty hard when you're first making that shift because that's when you need to be the most generous and that's when you're most likely to be the most stingy about it. 
Yeah. The most stingy and potentially the most like getting frustrated and wanting to kind of veer back towards negative reinforcement. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're going to get frustrated. The horse can get frustrated. Another huge part of that is the lifestyle of your horse. And I'm sure you have whole podcasts that are talking about like a better lifestyle for a horse where they're not getting so frustrated about food. But, you know, when I have students who show up to class with a horse who has 24 seven access to like low sugar hay compared to the student who's showing up and their horse gets fed three times a day. And they're like, yeah, actually, you know, he hasn't had breakfast yet. Well, now they've shown up with a hangry horse (laughs) and, and that horse just wants to eat, you know? So feeding like before a session or while you're grooming, make sure they're getting a lot of hay in there. So you don't come into class with a hungry horse or even if they are out there between they're getting 24 7 like slow feeders low sugar they're just calmer about food in general than those horses that are getting meals so that can make a huge difference too just to like the type of horse that shows up to school never mind how you train it Mm. yeah look I was reflecting on this the other day how often we go into like like you say, you know, maybe we're going to a clinic and you're like, well, my horse can't eat like for maybe they're standing in an arena for three hours, like with nothing. And then we're like, and you must perform. And you, <laughs> so, you know, like, <laughs> yes. And then if you do happen to, for some reason, have a cookie bag on you, because maybe you just want to give a cookie every now and again, but yeah. you expect the horse to be totally chill about the fact that you have the only food that's within the vicinity after yeah. all those hours. It's actually quite a lot to expect of a horse. Same and, time. you know, and if we're only eating salad and we, we had to go to something where we really had to think we were at some sort of seminar, maybe we even have to run around, um, that's going to be a lot. And we have a completely different digestive system than they do. So yep. it's yep. one of the kindest things you can do is just allow them to have some food, like either before a session or at the beginning of session incorporated in some way. Like a lot of times, even people who don't want to carry food on themselves, that's okay. We might use like hay piles. We might do like a little bit of work yep. and go have like a hay pile break with the horse, do a little bit more work, go have a hay pile break, keeps their horses like calmer, but still a little bit m- motivated. Yeah. And then we gradually work up to being able to carry the food on us as well. And, and even something like when I said about the big handful of hay, horses that are like overly mouthy, like the shark horses of the world, Uh um, when you can present them with a big mouthful of something, it just gets rid of that whole scarcity complex, because they're sitting there thinking, oh, I'm munching, instead of I just got like one little tiny pellet, and she's expecting that I think that's cool, right? Where's the next pellet, right? And, And it's not that they can't think while they're chewing. So sometimes if anybody's watching videos of my pony sailor, because he can get aroused by food you might notice he's chewing through most of his class because it takes him quite a bit to try to get through like all these hay pellets and the straw and everything he's still able to do like his collection work he can do like haunches in at trot at liberty and stop on a dime meanwhile he's chewing and i think I have to, he doesn't joke or anything because he knows I'm, I'm like slow feeding this stuff to him he knows how to like t- to deal with this you can also add water to your food kind of soak it but um we kind of have this hang up like oh our horses should absolutely not be eating at all while they're working yeah and yeah actually they spend a good portion of their day like eating or sleeping so if we were asking them to do something pretty difficult you know it's okay to let them eat a little bit it's, it's fine you can do it in between or whatever but totally this idea that they should not ever be eating when they're yeah. around us you see that a lot on I mean showing but also trail riding I've seen that where it's like don't let your horse eat at all on a trail it's a terrible habit and I I personally like I'll I'll let Diva like eat as we go along because I'm like you know as long as it's not bugging me that much she's enjoying (laughs) that she gets to graze out on all this different stuff in the woods and it's like well, a heaven part forbid of... she should enjoy the trip like right? it's your ride it's a part right? of her reward system it's like well why the heck am I coming out here if I can't eat from this beautiful field right so well, it, it's... it can be delivered in so many ways like for you you probably doing that kind of like as you go because she's yeah. still willing to like walk along and do her job it's not interfering with your trail ride she's not just like 
hauling you off and I mean no. if she was hauling you off into like a wood somewhere to go gobble that's different but but also that's something that if somebody's not comfortable with them eating as you go well you can ride for a certain distance and then you can make a very clear signal like hey, okay now it's time to have a grass break oh, really? you can eat while I'm you know chatting to my friend or something and then have a clear signal like okay it's time to go now but incorporating that food just makes it a little more pleasurable for our horses while they're out there. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause if you're going on, you know, like say a three, four hour ride and you don't let your horse eat at all, that's like, that's like a potential stressful time for their digestive system. I would think. I think it'd be a little bit like us having to like walk through a chocolate factory for three hours and you're a little hungry and somebody's like, you will not be eating at all during this or else. That's right. Or else. And there's always the or else with that as well, because people aren't just saying don't do that. They're going to be like pulling at their faces and they're going to be kicking them. They're going to be tapping with the whip. There's going to be all of this or else-ness to everything. Right. Yeah. yeah, So for sure. And that's, that's also one of the big mind shift pieces for me was, yeah, not making things happen and not or elseing things, but instead setting things up in a way that the horse was actually likely to do the things that I wanted them to do. Um, And initially that might be very small steps that we make have happen for that but when you're trying to set up something intricate later on which is more what I'm doing now like I'm working on actually the I'm working on the same behaviors now that I was working on before um, like in the academic art of riding so I'm finally figured out like how to do the harder um, maneuvers and side movements haunches in and like half pass and pirouette and all that kind of stuff just with positive reinforcement instead of you know having my whip or even having my cabison but when we're initially starting out just setting that environment up in a way that makes it so easy for the horse to get it. So no, we can't make it happen, but we can set up a scenario where the outcome is extremely likely to happen. And then the piece of that, that I didn't understand when I was talking to you about the reliability factor, Mm -hmm. I didn't understand reinforcement history. I didn't understand that if you have positively reinforced your horse enough, let's take something like stopping for example, if you've positively reinforced your horse often enough for stopping, then they want to stop, right? Stopping is something they enjoy. They look forward to it. It's been something that always came with good things. Um, and so they build up what's called a reinforcement history of, oh, I like stopping. When she says, whoa, I really want to, whoa, it's a good thing. And so then as we start working into more difficult scenarios, because we start gradually, you know, when we first start out maybe in the arena where your horse is super comfortable, and then gradually you might hit the trail and you might use that, whoa, your horse is calling back on that reinforcement history. So now even when they're in a slightly more uncomfortable scenario and you say, whoa, they still want to stop. And then again, you're going to give them some food rewards. So you start building up that reinforcement history in unfamiliar scenarios. As a trainer, though, it's your job to set up scenarios where your horse will want to whoa as you start to build up the threshold and you start to build up the complication. So no, you're not going to like just haul your horse to um, the show that takes place next to the Ferris wheel. You know, we all know that one, the fall fair. Yeah. And expect that when your horse's eyes are like bugging out of its head next to the Ferris wheel, that when you say, whoa, it's just going to happen. Because if you haven't carefully built up that reinforcement history, it might not happen. Right. So um, with negative reinforcement, that's also kind of important, but I find that we are a little bit worse about it because we can kind of rely on our tools to make it happen and we can kind of force it to happen not if our horse is completely over threshold of course I mean we all know that whole thing like you can't a bit doesn't stop a horse right like if you're on the trail and your horse is bolting doesn't matter what bit you're using it's not going to stop that horse but if we have built up that horse's stop off the bit then they'll understand it and we don't get into a situation where they're going to bolt right so it's that that's the reinforcement history with negative reinforcement but with positive reinforcement it's the same thing so you can build up reliability you can build up safety and that's something that i really didn't have a great understanding of before mm. i have an example of that too if you want to hear it Alexa. would love would love to hear okay. it okay absolutely so sky you know sky mm-hmm. um he was in my house for six months and he was a bolter on the ground like if you were leading him that's one of the reasons he came to my house is he would just like take off like a rocket he's a big guy 
big warm blood. There's not a lot of holding him if you're a little lady trainer, <laughs> I guess. And so I just took him off the lead for the first while. And I only worked him with just Liberty because I figured like now he doesn't even know he's getting away. He's just doing whatever. And with the target. And so I got him really good with that target. He loved his tennis ball on the stick. He would always come to that target whenever I presented it to him. And so the reinforcement history built up because he always got good things when he touched his target. And then one day when he got out of the paddock, and he's like running around in spring grass all over my five acres and having a blast. I initially went to go get the halter and go catch him. He saw me in the halter and he just took off tail up like, ah, I'm coming to you, lady. So then I was like, oh, I'll go get his target. Right. So then I go grab the tennis ball and the stick and I pulled that out there like I'm holding out a big flag. And I'm like, hey, Sky. And he looked at it and he's like, oh, my target. And he just came running over, sticks his nose on this tennis ball like he's like a lab or something. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I was able to just lead him back to the barn. No problem. Right. But that was reinforcement history mm -hmm. that had built up over six months. He had such a positive association to that target that even in a weird scenario where he was I'm competing with green grass, he sees that target. He just sees it as like a big lit up ball of wonderfulness. And he comes to me. And yeah, I really didn't get that before um, I studied positive reinforcement training. Mm -hmm. And so I just didn't realize that you would actually have things you could rely on, things you could count on, behaviors yeah, yeah. you could count on. Totally. And tools to help you do it. I hear you speaking and I'm like, I need to dedicate myself more to this work because I think I I dabble and I and I I'm sure a lot of people feel that where it's like they've done some, but not like you said, you know, really dedicated yourself to this type of training. Well, and the question I asked you there too, Alexa, because it's a question I've asked my students before is like, how many years have you dedicated yourself to learning negative reinforcement training? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> Many. Yeah, a lot. Probably yeah. like 30 something or something like yeah, that. Something I know because I had there. to ask, answer the question for myself the other day. And I was like, it's 32 years. It's 32 yeah. years that I dedicated myself to learning negative reinforcement training. And I still have things to learn about negative reinforcement training. But then we pick up like a clicker and a bag of treats and we expect to be good at it after often a few sessions, right? Yeah. Like students might be like, oh, I tried that. Just didn't really work for me and my horse. <laughs> like, <laughs> totally. <laughs> so, totally. Well, yeah. how often did you try it? How much instruction did you get in it? How many books did you study? Like, do you really understand it? Because actually there's not that much, like it's, it's kind of hard to learn about it. There are programs if you know where they are, but it's not as widely spread. So how much did you commit, dedicate yourself to learning this? Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. And you recognize the challenge. Like it's, it's not just a challenge for our horses. It's, it's maybe even more so a challenge for our own learning style. Like when you've had something so huh, reinforced, like learning negative reinforcement, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, changing from that can be, um, like take a lot of like you know a shift in the mind and I I remember that I I don't know if you remember my mare dream um, yes but that was where I first started kind of exploring clicker training so that would have been oh my gosh that was a long time ago you had long dream. time I ago. want to say 10 -ish years ago at least tw probably t more like 12 yeah and it happened because she was so I mean I don't know if you remember but she had like rope burns like imprinted in her neck and she had like a what I called a two by four mark on her nose like she had been she had been through, through some it. stuff big time she'd been a yeah, pack horse. I remember that she was a difficult personality was but... really she was really I can honestly say very traumatized and I couldn't negative reinforcement just put her into like she would go over a threshold immediately any pressure right. um and so I realized that okay I can't like that's not going to work for us and I happened to live next door to a woman who Victoria who was learning clicker training and she came over and showed me kind of the basics and 
Uh, but I remember with Dream, we would go out on the trail and I would pony her on Diva. So I would, and we lived up on this, um, up at the top of Kingber. Like we, it was when I was out, like in Cobble Hill. And so the trails all had trees, like pretty close. Oh yeah, it's really hard right? to go ponying. And so horse ponying a horse through there was, I would I would generally drop a rope like every most rides because Dream would go one way around a tree and I would go another and, but I do remember that reliability factor where I had learned with her to click her the moment her ear turned back to me right so even if she was headed down the trail even if she turned her little ear towards me one bit I would click her because of course if you tried to chase her she was just gone okay and she was amazing that reliability piece as soon as I clicked her she would go and she'd walk back towards me on the trail and I'd give her a treat and like we I'd pick up her rope and we'd keep going. And I just thought it was the most miraculous thing that this horse with a pretty high trauma response to pressure and and who could have easily just run home and away made the choice to each time. I never lost her. I probably right. she was I like, don't know. came on back. Yeah. And she would have had like that clicker aspect and the treat aspect. She yeah. would have had the diva aspect. The diva she would have aspect. Had the aspect that you weren't trying to torture her. But those are all like pretty positive things. She likes being around you. She yep. likes being with diva. She hears that click. She knows she's going to get a food reward. She turns her little self back around and she comes back to you. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you can really, yeah, you can count on it. And, and like you said, it seemed miraculous. I think that's one of those things like we just don't anticipate that it could work with that kind of efficiency and so we have a lot of skepticism about well what are you going to do in an emergency like you kind of hear that question come up a lot like well okay number one we tend to be a little bit better about not getting ourselves into an emergency in the first place now yeah, yeah. I'm not saying we always do believe me we do not but we're a little bit better at it the reason is just because we can't rely on our tools quite as much to make things happen and also because we tend to study um as positive reinforcement trainers we tend to actually study behavior of horses actually even a little bit more than negative reinforcement trainers do um like from an actual science kind of perspective so we're a little bit better about maybe creating layers sometimes at least mm. i'm going to use that as a generalization i'm learning to create more layers of training smaller steps which we call approximations so that we have a better chance of success so we're really setting ourselves up for success so like you probably with dream didn't just head into the forest immediately mm -hmm. with you know you you worked at that you set that up and you set that whole scenario up and you took your time doing it so that you were let less likely to have a situation where she was just going to run home and I'm not saying that we don't do that as negative reinforcement trainers either they're the best negative reinforcement trainers do they they have lots of little baby steps to make it more likely that the horse is going to succeed but they can still rely a little bit and I know because I did rely a little bit on my tools um, in terms of like just add more pressure because I could always just kind of fall back on that I could just add a little bit more pressure now you could say with positive reinforcement training well you could probably just add more cookies but that doesn't always work because you're trying to get the behavior first and then you know get the cookie so it doesn't always work whereas say if I want my horse's shoulder over with a whip if I want my horse to move their shoulder over, I can show them the whip first as like, hello, this whip is towards your shoulder. Now I can wave that whip towards your shoulder. Now I can actually tap your shoulder. Um, if you still don't move, I can increase the pressure again. I can give you a pretty good zap with that and it can get you to move your shoulder over. Now, if I want you to move your shoulder over and I'm doing clicker training, I don't tend to use luring a lot where I'm actually got food in my hand and I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. move your shoulder over. Mm -hmm. So now I still have to figure out how am I going to get you to move your shoulder over? And if you don't understand what I'm talking about, I need to find a way to translate that. And I find um, that with positive reinforcement training, I have gotten more creative plus learned more about like, oh, what are all the different methods that I could use to like start getting that horse's shoulder to move over, to get that horse to want 
to move his shoulder over, whether I use different types of targeting or whether I just happen to capture that that horse leans over that direction. Um, but just adding more cookies to it isn't usually the answer. <laughs> Not that it would never be an answer. I mean, you could have treats in your hand and you could take them over that way, you know, and your horse can follow. And that is one way to do it. But I find that I have become a lot more creative with positive reinforcement training, just because I can't just fall back into that. Like, well, I'll just make this happen. I'll just add more pressure to it. It'll just, it'll work. It'll mm-hmm. go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And you know, one of the things I do wonder about, I suppose, because my training is a little bit in, in terms of this, like I said, I sometimes forget my fanny pack. I, um, I'm not always consistent with having treats on board. Um, I do find that the girls like even just like, no, it seems that they like just getting the click and it's like, oh, I did a thing that was good. Um, Do you think it's okay to have like intermittent, like that you're not always being super consistent or is it best to be like, I must have food every time I go? Oh, well, I think you're always... It's, it's, it's not that you necessarily always have to have food on you because you have other things that you can do that your horse might enjoy if your horse enjoys it like sailor for example i can train him with scratches as well right because yeah. he just loves a good scratch that's not going to work with extra right extra is going to look at me like don't touch me and then when i asked her to do something difficult i can rely on my reinforcement history for a little while which is kind of what just the click does like yeah. if you are just clicking but you're not feeding the horse has has a positive association with the click so you're right they go oh yeah I got that right the question is how many clicks are you going to get mm-hmm. before they're going to be like well your Man. click doesn't really have any power so I'm not really interested um and it'd be the same thing with extra she's got quite a history of doing a lot of intricate things with me so she's going to go there's going to be a certain amount of time where she's going to work with me and do all the things and if I don't add some reinforcement at some point eventually she's going to just be like you know Heather there's some grass at the edge of the arena I will catch you later and that's because the grass is more reinforcing than me so I just always look at it as like there's this balancing Mm -hmm. act and in in the same way as like say if I'm teaching my horse to stand up stand still my horse isn't standing still I'm not making standing still reinforcing enough right? I'm just not making it pleasurable right. enough to stand right. still. So if I can make it pleasurable enough to stand still, just because the two of us are standing together and we're enjoying each other's company. Great. If I have to scratch you, great. If I have to feed you, great. But it's the question of what will make this actually worth doing for you. And so that's a question I often ask myself, if my horse is not doing the thing that I want, uh-huh. that I'm hoping for them to do. I have to ask myself like, Number one, am I making any bit of sense? Because maybe the horse cannot possibly guess what it is that I'm asking him to do. And number two, am I making that reinforcing enough? Like I kind of picture, because I'm a very imaginative visual person, like these big plus signs in the air. And like if, if one of my students, for example, they're working at Liberty and their horse is just like, gone off to go graze at the other end of my paddock I picture this giant big plus sign hanging over that field where that horse is grazing and a little wee plus sign over the student right like the student is just not a big enough plus to get that horse to stay with them if they were more reinforcing then they're going to win out over the grass and if they've got a bigger reinforcement history with that horse that horse has really had a lot of fun with this person they've had blood food rewards they've had the scratches they enjoy themselves they're not stressed out they're not going to that grass because that person is just more reinforcing in the activities that they do so that's kind of a question i'm always asking is like what's the balance of reinforcement am i more reinforcing than this other thing mm-hmm mm-hmm did that and, answer your question? Because yeah, I was that's, like, that's I think super I, helpful. I, could, I could easily get lost in question no, zones now, no. especially my head injury. I go on like little tours. <laughs> you did very well. I do. I, I do have curiosity because um, with my two mares, you you know them fairly well. I think mm-hmm. um, Diva being 
long, kind of like extra long history of negative reinforcement training. Mm-hmm. But um, very good at it. Like Deep is very, very good, good at it. it. Really and understands very it. Very responsive yeah. to it. You don't have to use much pressure with her. Not she at all. Gets it. Yeah. And, but also very good, you know, like similarly stoked about positive, you know, positive reinforcement Mm -hmm. um although i haven't done it as much because i think this is a trap that many fall into where it's like she's so good (laughs) (laughs) why switch why (laughs) don't 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 break it it works right yeah that's that's saying (laughs) yeah and after you know what we've been together 19 years it's like it's become so subtle and easy and just like this communication system that we've developed over that time um and so you know there's there's this part of me that wonders about about making shifts there like what that would yeah you know I what that looks like and whether it's worth doing yeah Yeah. and and also Um, you know there's the sense of and I'm sure you get this a lot where as you know there's the gaps there's like the Diva has a hard time trailering on her own gap. There's the, you know, like these, like the separation anxiety gap. Like there's things where it's like negative reinforcement is not going to, does not support her with these things because she's, she goes over threshold and you can't add, you know, adding more pressure to this scenario is not a good idea for her. So yeah, it's become this really interesting place of like, okay, do we continue down that path of of sort of piecemealing positive reinforcement when it works, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that well, was- okay, to answer your question, <laughs> there's a couple ways that you can approach that, right? Because yeah. you're right, she has a super effective response, she understands and she's outwardly pretty relaxed about negative reinforcement it it makes good sense to her you guys have a good thing going um and and because of that yeah you can bring positive reinforcement more into like areas that are like trouble spots or you can bring positive reinforcement into certain behaviors that you maybe want to build up or even things you just kind of want to challenge yourself on because um it, it also changes like when you start carrying food because like my horses might know how to ground tie when I'm a negative reinforcement person, right? They might really understand like, okay, she drops the lead rope, I stand. Well, now she's got a pack of cookies on her. <laughs> I don't think I stand at all. I follow her everywhere like a little lap dog. You know, but it's like a different thing then at that point. Um, and then somebody would be like, well, that's why you don't carry the treats on you. But actually I would say, I still want that horse to be able to stand just as still there um just like they did before the thing with before was they were standing there because they didn't really have that much motivation to move and they were they were corrected if they did I know because I've had horses that were really beautifully ground tied right I'd correct them if they stepped off their place Mm -hmm. so they knew they should stay but as soon as there's something more appealing like a person wandering around at the treat pack then they want to follow you um but you can create like a challenge around something like that like oh I just want to teach this but maybe that doesn't mean that I'm going to carry it into my riding or maybe I'm not going to carry Mm -hmm. it into my groundwork or maybe I just want to work on it with a husbandry thing like maybe my horse could really improve something like their deworming or their picking up their feet and that's an area that I'm going to carry treats on me and I'm going to work it in that area but I'm yeah I'm not going to take it into the arena um, because it doesn't have to be that you would take it into every single aspect or you could do what I did before where I always, I, I transitioned to always carrying treats on me um, and having a clicker, but I still had my whip and, you know, my Tavison and I just clicked and treated for the things that I liked. I was very like strict about the fact that I only gave the treat when my horse was standing quietly with their head nice and straight. So I had no difficulties with them mugging while I was working. Um, but we just kept on training essentially the same way we'd always trained. I mean, mm. I was really using all of my negative reinforcement as a tool and as an aid and as a signal but I was doing as the positive reinforcement people call it adding the cherry on top of adding the reward afterwards but I found it actually worked quite well because it did make the horses more 
happy like they were happier about doing things because the rewards did get added to their work like they knew what the negative reinforcement meant but rather than just having the relief of the release mm -hmm. of pressure they also got something yummy right so it actually did add more to the work so those are two ways that you can bring it in yeah and then the other way that we could challenge you could be like what I did with extra where I was like okay, she's really good with negative reinforcement. She's quite highly trained. She responds to very subtle signals. But what happens when I just toss the whip down? Now, I made the assumption that it shouldn't be a big deal, Alexa. I was kind of like, once I drop my whip, like she knows all the aids and everything, like there shouldn't really be a change. Mm. And you know what she said to me? Yeah. See you later. <laughs> she was like, not interested in doing things with me anymore because I had nothing to like back it up. Right. Like yep. I, I couldn't yep. be kind of like, you know, we're going to do it like this or else. And so even if I showed the exact same signal with my hand, I thought it would make perfect sense to her. Like I thought she knows this, like she knows, say, say we take an example, an easy example, move your hindquarters away from me. Right. Yep. Now we do that when we're grooming. Right. We might just yep. like point them and then um, push them over or whatever. And my horse, she knows that one very well. She did a lot of shoulder in and all that kind of stuff. So she knew how to move her butt out. But it turns out when I dropped my whip completely mm -hmm. and I just pointed her butt, she was like, that's cute, Heather, but I don't actually need to move my bum over now. You have nothing to back this up. It's kind of like, well, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. And I was like, hmm, well, I don't know. <laughs> Good question. Now I can't just push you over so now that my hands are tied on this because I've made a little rule for myself I don't know how I'm getting your butt over well so I had to teach her how to move her butt over um I used targeting from the front mm -hmm. I like moved her nose to a certain location by her moving to the target her butt swung out I clicked she treated she started getting invested in this idea that when you move your butt out you get cookies as long as I still point at her butt right but now she's invested yep. in it now she wants to do it so yeah, now she does it all the time. Now yeah. it's easy, right? But I didn't think I'd have to reteach that. Like I thought that made perfect sense. I point, you move your butt over. But as soon as I didn't have anything to back up, as soon as I didn't have like a little bit of that threat to irritate her with, it turned out, no, <laughs> she wasn't into it. So so it can be a little question. And the question I guess I started asking myself um, was, a, does my horse know how to do things as well as I thought that they yeah. knew, that she knew how to do it? And B, was she as motivated to do the things as I thought? Like, I thought that she didn't mind doing these things and she kind of enjoyed doing them and it, it all made sense. Well, it turns out she didn't do things nearly as well as soon as I couldn't back it up. Mm -hmm. So, and it, I found that with Liberty too, but we actually mentioned that in the last podcast um, because... She was a fantastic Liberty horse before, right? Mm -hmm. I could do demonstrations. I could do them on grass, all sorts of things. And I wasn't one of those really high pressure people. If she did stop to eat, I used to like quickly send her forward with pressure. Like I would wave the whip behind her and I'd say head up and then she'd bring her head up and she'd come to me. But I never like chased her around a paddock yeah. or anything. I didn't round pen her, keep pressure on her. So I thought I was pretty nice. But then when I didn't have a whip in my hand and she mm -hmm. was grazing or staring off at the neighbors and I was like, hey, extra, can you come over? She was like, why? <laughs> and so it turned out that she was really moving off the grass before because she knew I could make her move off mm -hmm. the grass. Mm -hmm. um, whereas now she comes off the grass because she's like, yeah, I want to come off the grass because I'm going to get food. And then there are those people who are going to be like, yeah, but she's only doing it for the food. Well, in the other way, she's only doing it because there's an implied threat. Those are the only two reasons a horse will do anything. They're going to do something because they enjoy doing it, because they want to do it, or they're going to do it because they're avoiding something they don't like. You kind of can't get out of that paradigm. Like, I know humans want to. We really want our horses to do everything with us just, just because they love doing everything just as much as we do. And they do love doing things sometimes for short periods. But are they going to do it consistently? Are they going to work on really hard things? Are they going to make difficult decisions um, consistently, like every time, just because they're friends with you and not because you give them anything rewarding and not because you're making anything irritating not really like yeah beings don't really work that way and we can't it's a tough pill but we have to swallow it 
It's, it's a challenging one. I know a lot of, you know, for a lot of people, it's like, oh yeah, there's this intrinsic motivation. And I think there is to a point. There is, there is Absolutely. intrinsic Like I watched you in Sailor and I'm like, there is intrinsic motivation there to a point because he loves to work. He um, loves movement. He loves interaction. Right? He loves solving puzzles. You know, yeah. there is definitely intrinsic motivation. And I do believe in intrinsic motivation. But can you count on... And intrinsic is it motivation. reliable? Yeah. Yeah. It, uh-huh. It's more of a case of like, and, and actually, if you like study the people who are really studying intrinsic motivation, one of the things they talk about the most is when the horse says no, because yeah. they really <laughs> have to honor that. And I'm not saying that we don't in other forms of training, like we should actually really honor the no in other forms of training as well. But if you are only counting on intrinsic motivation, then you really need to wait for and hope for and to try to inspire those moments like when your horse does play, right? But yep. those are kind of brief and far between considering the length of a day. And, and like also I think of like, if that's all you want to do with your horse, like if Mm -hmm. you want to spend some time with them and occasionally have a little bit of play time, then that's probably going to work something like intrinsic. But if you want something that you can be like, okay, I'm taking my horse down to the arena and we're going to be working on these things. um, You're going to have a better chance if you're using some sort of reinforcement, negative or positive, right? Rather than just counting on them enjoying that experience. Yeah. And it's, and I go to this place as well. Like, I love the idea of intrinsic motivation. Absolutely. I mean, it's so, you know, um, yeah, we would all want that from our horses. And then I think because I'm a catastrophizer and I have anxiety about, oh, but what if we have to evacuate or what if I have a bed (laughs) issue or like, what if like, yeah, we have to halter up and like skedaddle or whatever, right? Or I have to remove my horse from a fence or there's something that goes on because this happens with horses, you know? Um, okay, what then, right? Can I, can I do those things? I mean, um, even worming, like I wormed my girls the other day. It was like so much easier than it's ever been because I use clicker training. Like, yeah. And I didn't even use it very well. (laughs) But it was so. Yeah, I've been I've been working on that too with my horse with the dormy, and it's interesting because like of all the layers you have to put in like all the approximations uh-huh. because my horse is fine if you don't have any dewormer in your dewormer yeah they are fine or whatever you, like, yeah. like that you can put that in your mouth yeah. all day long and they're like yes we like this we know we get clicked for that yeah. as soon as like the cap is off a real dewormer and they can smell that real dewormer they're just like we know about <laughs> the real stuff we're not really interested in participating anymore however like you said my horses i actually dewormed them yesterday so this mm-hmm. is pretty like real real moment we're having they were better about mm-hmm. it because of all that reinforcement history before and much more forgiving because they totally. talk about having that like bank account right so for something like cooperative care yeah you're going to be practicing deworming a lot and making it a pleasurable experience and then there's going to be that time when you are putting this disgusting stuff and in their mouth do and they it. really do yeah. not enjoy that but because you have all this past that you can draw on when you make that withdrawal out of the trust account, your horse is kind of like, geez, you make some bad decisions and you put some really crappy stuff in my face. But you know what? I still like you. I'm still going to participate in your crazy yeah. little activities. And um, yeah, hopefully you don't give me something nasty tasting next time. Totally. <laughs> and, and they're just, it's just comes around better. Yeah, no, I would totally agree. I but it's that- not that we don't ever do something that they, yeah. they have to do because yeah yeah, like you said sometimes you gotta it's gotta be like a veterinary situation or and maybe it's not something that we've prepared for I would say as horse people when we think we've prepared we really haven't like we're notorious for being pretty impatient and I say that because I'm like comparing it to the zoo people who are like every time they're interacting with that animal they're practicing all these husbandry things 
Um, I'm actually in the cooperative care conference again. I think it's next week. It's an online conference with yeah, um, really cool. Peter uh, Hilliam puts that on. It's like a suspenseful thing. And it's a really great conference where you learn all about cooperative care. But when you see the work that goes into it, and by work, I really mean just how often. Like, yeah. it's not, most of us are kind of like, well, I'm going to be deworming today. So I should probably practice deworming a little bit before I deworm today. Oh, no, That's I haven't exactly practiced what I did. the last, like, three months. <laughs> no. <Yes. laughs> or, or maybe I started practicing yesterday. Like, it's not something that we make, like, a daily part of our practice totally. even though it doesn't take that long to do um yeah <laughs> I know I remember things. seeing like a giraffe who was getting its feet trimmed and it was like totally at liberty like I'm just doing my feet and <laughs> like you know he was getting treats he was getting rewarded and I'm like they have practiced this like this they is obviously something they really worked at and he was so calm he or she don't know happy giraffe really most impressive ones i saw was and it was in the the conference i think it was a sea lion and he is having a scope done uh -huh. at liberty okay because i don't yeah, even yeah. think there's a way of restraining a sea lion <laughs> was gonna say. slippery little buggers but anyway <laughs> he's got his like he's doing a chin rest thing mouth is open he's got this scope all the way down his throat there's like three different people around doing this and it was like a three to five minute procedure where he keeps his mouth open and they're scoping him and his eyeballs are just kind of rolling around because he's like well this is really uncomfortable <laughs> but, he's like, but he's doing his yeah. job because they had so carefully prepared this process yeah. for him and he understood what he needed to do and he knew that it was worth doing. And I think as horse people, oh, we are so guilty of oh. not doing that. Like it's not, it just hasn't been part of our upbringing. It's no. certainly not something that my coaches weren't like instilling yeah. that in me all through my youth. No, they weren't no. saying like, we should make like husbandry behavior other than like just grooming and picking out feet. Um, the, the hard things, you know, like eye wipes and mouth checks and, you know, practice, actually practicing, yeah. even if it's fake trimming the feet, putting them up on the pedestals. And, and I'm guilty of that because my, my trimmer yeah. also, she's like, yeah, clicker uh -huh. trainer, you clearly don't practice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As my horse is stomping Sorry, the Nicole. thing down, you know, <laughs> um, and I'm like, okay, yeah, I got to put that on my list of things to do. But like, it's it wouldn't be that hard, but we're no. pretty guilty of like just getting on with like whatever it is we want to do. We want to get on with on the this. fun stuff, and we don't. Also, I think we're guilty of. I know I'm guilty of. I don't want to think about like my horse getting hurt. <laughs> just not going to prepare her. We're just going to pretend that it's reality. not going to happen. It never quite works out so well. Like, I think it's good to do that preparation work. W what a dream to have your horse super happy putting their feet up for their trim, that they are cool with these things, that it's not a stressful experience. I think that's so great. Um, yeah, and if you can do it when it isn't a stressor, like, yeah. even, I think nearly everybody knows now that when it comes to, like, good horse trailering, the day to practice horse trailering is not the day of no. the show. We mm -hmm. all know that now, right? Like that's kind of become like common knowledge now <laughs> that we should actually prepare our horses for trailering before the day of the show, Absolutely. before they have to be evacuated because the wildfires are here. We should have these horses able to easily move into the trailer. And we've, we've come to a place where we understand that. But then when it comes to some of these cooperative care type things or like looking after an injury oh no we don't prepare that and now the horse is hurt and like we're in a bit of a stressed out state they're yeah. in a stressed out state they sure don't want you like doing whatever it is you're doing because now it actually hurts and it's uncomfortable um and we haven't prepared it but yeah. it really needs to be something that we think about more often and we prepare and when it comes to those types of things I think that's where something like clicker training really excels because yep. negative reinforcement doesn't have mm -hmm. a lot of a leg to stand on when it comes to doing something truly unpleasant to your animal because the trade-off is just not there, right? Totally. <laughs> like they're just going to be like, okay, you, you're amping up the pressure, but I would rather deal with the pressure than deal with this guy sticking his finger in my wound, you know? So they, yeah. they go, go to that, that yeah. place For and sure. you don't have that positive experience to balance it out. Yeah. No Although, way. as my vet always said, I'm just so thankful I can just tranquilize them. 
<laughs> but anyway, <laughs> would be nice if he didn't have to do that. It would be it nice would... if the horse just willingly stood there like the giraffe, right? I mean, if a polar bear can willingly stick its paw through the cage and have its blood drawn, I Amazing. think we can do most of the things that we do with horses a whole lot easier. We yeah. just haven't set ourselves up that way because, yeah, we're kind of notoriously impatient and like on to other things like we want to just ride our horses yeah we don't <laughs> we want, want them the good cool at like stuff. taking a needle totally. we don't put a lot of effort into getting them to take needles in general yeah yeah for sure for sure that whereas is... when i got sailor actually when he was like feral yeah. i mm, got him I remember and yep. he had to prepare for his gelding right and so once i had like tamed him which was all done with clicker um i started like putting everything I could think of in his like towards his neck like um screwdrivers <laughs> like, like anything pokey that I could find I was like stabbing him in the neck with these things not enough that I was like leaving a mark people like when I say stabbing I'm the type of person who's very exaggerated mm -hmm. but anyway I would poke him enough that it was slightly uncomfortable and then he'd get his like rewards after and he would just be like Heather you just do the darndest things you know you're just a weirdo but hey if I'm gonna get some food rewards mm -hmm. I'm gonna put up with this and consequently when the vets came to do the needles and everything he was an angel about it right he was yeah. just so good and for anybody interested in adding more positive reinforcement training like that's kind yeah. of the students that I'm dealing with awesome. now they don't have to want to go 100% or you can want to go 100% and I will gladly teach you to do that but it's mostly about like, um, I'd say my biggest concentration right now is helping people make that shift. Fantastic. Like helping yeah. them actually achieve totally. what they want in a more positive way yeah. without judging them for whatever it is they're currently doing. <laughs> so appreciate you always on the podcast coming and sharing with us. And how do people get in touch with you? I think these days the easiest way to get in touch with me is like, if you actually want to actually talk with me is like Facebook Messenger, yeah. like Messenger is probably it, or, or like following me on Instagram. Yeah. And I'm kind of bad about not really posting my horse training stuff on my horse training page on Facebook. I'm, so you actually just have to friend me or follow me yeah. on Facebook. Uh, that's the best way at this point to get in touch with me. This, this has been grand as always. Love our conversations. I hope everybody who's been listening has learned a thing or two. I know I have, and I'm glad to be back here for season six, everyone. And, yes. Uh, thank you everyone who's watching and uh, take care of yourself, Alexa. Thank you. You too, Heather. Okay. Bye everyone.